Thanks, Deborah. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Let's talk about idols. <laughs> I would go on more about Mother's Day, but happy Mother's Day to everyone. I think Deborah did a great job. Uh, thank you for all of you that made it. Um, we are uh, going to do a two-part series in coming from the book of Galatians. So we're going to be in the book of Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 through 11 today. And uh, if you don't know where Galatians in is, it's at the end of the New Testament towards the end of your Bible. Uh, when Doug asked me to come speak for a couple Sundays, I thought about it and prayed about it. And the, uh, the thought of idolatry and freedom and these kind of counteracting concepts came to my mind. And idolatry kind of because... Uh, and I, I just, le I actually left it there, so I feel like I'm idle free. I didn't bring my cell phone up with me. Because I, I just, I, I, I noticed myself, and still do every free moment, going for the cell phone, right? And it just, it just made me think of, you know, idolatry. And then freedom, only in that, uh, about three years ago, I did a study, what do you mean, more than that? Studying the book of Galatians. And it's probably one of my favorite books in the Bible, and it talks about freedom. Uh, and why God has chosen to set us free um, and, and, and how we can move out from idols and into freedom. And idol is not a word we use a lot today in our culture, uh, but we have them. And the concept is just as relevant today as it was when this letter was written. And even though we use different languages, I think the idols really are the same. Even though we, we don't have these little objects, we really do have the same things that we put up as idols in our life. So uh, why don't you join me? I'm going to be reading uh, starting in chapter 8. So if you could follow along with me um, in Galatians. However, it starts in chapter 8, or verse, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 8. However, at that time... When you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. But now that you've come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain." Before we kind of get into the focus of the study, I want to give you a little bit of background on Galatians. Grant, you with me so far? Cool. Awesome. Um, I may call a few of you out while we're going, so just be ready for that. Um, so Galatia, where is it located? It's, it's in the middle of what is now modern-day Turkey, so in Asia Minor. And the people here talk, he's talking to, these are new believers. These are people that Paul had actually converted on his missionary journeys. And in fact, in, uh, Paul had three missionary journeys that are recorded in the book of Acts. And in each of those, uh, he went through the region of Galatia as part of those journeys. Uh, and in fact, on his first missionary trip, uh, it's recording in Acts how amazing the response of these people were to the gospel. Uh, it says that after Paul preached, he and Barnabas are walking away, and, it's, and it literally says they kept begging them that they would come back and teach again. That's how powerful this response was to the gospel. It's, I mean, frankly, it's, it's like when I teach here. People just begging me for more. It, it happens all the time. Uh, you, you'll see. So these are people who fervently accepted and received this message of freedom that Paul was preaching about. And these were not Jews. These were Gentile pagans. I mean, these guys were as pagan as they come. Uh, they had more gods than you can shake a stick at. They were living very licentious lifestyles. Uh, and because of that, they were experiencing all the works of the flesh that we read about later in this book of Galatians hatred and envy and strife and everything that goes along with that, which, you know, is probably why this message of freedom and the uh, fruits of the Spirit was so appealing to them. And I think it's appealing to people in our own lives, too. Uh, so what Paul says, is, you know, why he wrote the letter um, is that they 
after he taught them and walked through these missionary journeys, he gets a message that says that they're turning back and enslaving themselves again. And that is the purpose of writing this letter, so that they don't go back to what he calls the elementary things uh, that they were enslaved to once before. So what's interesting about this, and you can see up in uh, verses 9 through um, 10 there that we read before, <clears throat> is that uh, he said that there's these weak and worthless elemental things. Now, the word that's used is this Greek word, and I'm going to try to pronounce it correctly. It's called stoichia tu cosmu. And if you're into etymology, anyone into etymology? I know someone that is, my wife. I mean, she is excited about getting a book of etymology for her birthday, I remember this, as like Eric Johnson would be getting a new truck. I mean, this is, is exciting. And I've never been a massive etymology guy, to be perfectly honest with you, but it's really interesting. So it, it's, it's basically the study of origins of words. And if you look at this word, these basic elements, what he's saying is that these are the ABCs of the world. This is how the world works. And the pagans believed that behind every basic element, there was a spirit. And paganism, as you know, it's, it's a polytheistic type of belief system, and they had gods for everything. They had gods for agriculture and love and beauty and uh, fun and financial security. Every town had their own god. And so it wasn't so interesting the god, but everything about life had a god associated with it. And as I mentioned, these were really licentious people. They were, they were having sex in the streets. I mean, they were, they were crazy, right? It was, a, it, was a, it was an evil culture. Uh, we get a taste of it from the book of Ephesus, and those that are going through the study with Derek uh, in Journey in the Morning hear about all the stuff that was going on in these cultures. And this is the, the life that they had left behind. And they've accepted the gospel, and they're moving on. And what's really interesting is that he uses this same term earlier in the book of Galatians in chapter, in, in chapter 4, verses 3 through 5, the second verse that's quoted there. I'm going to read that off to you. So chapter 4, verses 3 through 5, he says, So also we, and when he says we, Paul, he's talking now about the Jews, not the Gentiles. He says, So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things. That same exact phrase, the ABCs of the world. But when the, t the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we may receive the adoptions as sons. So what he's saying is that you were under these elemental principles of the world, and you've been freed by that for the good news of the gospel. But now you're going back to those elemental principles. Why are you doing that? He's not saying they're going back to paganism. Because again, if we, we look at the first verses, what he says they're going back to is the observance of days and months and years. What he's referring to here are Jewish holidays. Passover, uh, Rosh Hashanah, and these other celebrations of the Jewish religion. And what's absolutely amazing about this is Paul is equating paganism with following the law, which is astonishing because this is a Jew, this is a Pharisee, you know. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He followed the letter of the law before following Christ. And now he's taking that same law and he's equating it with the most licentious lifestyle that was in that culture of the day. It's just an incredible thing. So the question is, well, you know, why, why is he doing this? Well, again, I think it gets back to... Um, his, his thoughts about the gospel. Anytime you add anything to or put anything in place of the gospel, you are creating an idol. You are creating a false god. Because what Christ has done is he has finished the work. And the interesting thing about idols are is they're not necessarily bad things. Let me give you an example of, an, of another thing in scripture where we kind of see this, this. This concept of the licentious versus the rule follower. Take a look at, this, at the, um, the prodigal son. For those that you don't know it, it's a story um, in the Gospels 
that Jesus talks about of a father who has two sons. And it's, it's known as the story of the prodigal son. But you have one son who is the younger one, and he wants his inheritance now while his father is still alive. And in that culture, what he's basically saying is, drop dead dad, I want my money. I mean, that's what he is saying. It's, it was very rude and, 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 and a, a huge affront to his father. So the father, loving the son, gives him his inheritance, all his money, takes it off, and squanders it with licentious living. The other son, the good son, stays with his father. He does everything right. He goes to the festival. He works the farm. He honors his father. And what happens in that story is that the prodigal, realizing his mistake, comes back uh, ready to beg forgiveness for the father. And the father says, don't worry about it. Come back in. You're in with me. But the other son, the one that was living right, the one that was doing all the good things, he doesn't accept it. In fact, he's, he's not happy about it. Uh, and he tells the father so much. He goes, I've done everything right, and you've never given me a thing. And, and, and really, I think what Paul is saying here is you have these different things. They look very different. You've got this pagan worship, crazy living, and you've got this rule-based living. Each of them are under idols, it, or is, is idolatry. In other words, they're putting something above God and above the grace of God and the good news. And it's, it's almost insidious that for those that are in the second camp, the right living, it can be almost even more insidious because you think what you're doing is right. You don't even know that you're missing the truth. So again, why does Paul do this? Because anything that we put above God, no matter how good it is, is can become an idol. And I, you know, I've got some pictures listed up there, but a good definition of it is that anything that occupies that space, anything that we become dependent upon that is essential for us to be happy, to be content, to feel safe, those can all become idols. Now, I'm not saying that everything is an idol. It's all about how you treat it. And we're going to talk about that uh, in more depth. Um, what's, what's interesting is that throughout Scripture, we're kind of fed this message. If you look at the Ten Commandments, does anyone remember what are the first two commandments? What's the first commandment? You should, you should have no God before me. And the second commandment is, do not make any idols or graven images. So the first two of the Ten Commandments are about idolatry. And I think what you're going to see is if we break any of the rest of the commandments, it's because we have an idol in our life. And I'm going to go in and kind of go in depth about why that is. In the New Testament, we don't hear as much about idols. However, there's a really interesting comment uh, at the last verse of the, bur the book of 1 John. And if you know of anything about the book of 1 John, it's five chapters long. It's not, a, it's not a short little letter. And he repeatedly focuses on three themes. One is living in the light, how to be holy. The second is living in love, how we relate to one another. And the third is living in God. How can we have a really strong relationship with the Father? Now, my wife Kimberly is a seminary professor. And over the past nine months, approximately, she uh, was asked to teach a class, which was a complete survey of the whole Bible. All, how many books is it, 67? 66 books, I added one. Um, so she not only had to read all of them, but she had to give presentations on all of them, and then explain it to counseling students uh, in a way that would make sense to them, and do this in how many total courses, how many total classes? 14. So that's a lot of material, a lot to compose, and then write it. And I remember when she got done studying the book of 1 John, she said, I am so tired of John repeating love, 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 light, light, light. And he does all through the book, except for the last verse. And it's really odd. In the, in the last verse, he says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. And walks away. So it's like, well, where did that come from? 
He's talking about living in love. He's talking about living in the light. He's talking about living with God. And all of a sudden, little children, keep yourselves from idols. So either it was just this random thought he threw at the end, right? Oh, yeah, I, 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 I forgot about this. Or there's actually more to it. And um, there's this uh, theologian. His name is Dr. David Martin Lewis. And he studied the book of 1 John. He wrote 62 sermons on a five-chapter book. I call this guy the, uh, the Derek Ewan of his day. If any of you that go to the journey class, I think we've been in the book of Ephesians for about five years. Am I right, Eric? So this guy exhaustively studied it. And his take on that last verse was this, is that the only reasonable explanation is that he is giving a summary of what he has said for the previous five chapters. So what he's teaching us is that the greatest enemy and danger that confronts us is not deeds, it's not sins and actions, it's our thoughts and where we put our values. Those are what drive us to do those evil deeds. Um, and, and, and there's all kinds of things uh, that hit us that cause us to do this. So that's the principle. When I fail to be like Jesus, when I sin, we always focus on the sin, right? The action. But what we really need to think about is the thought, the value that got us to that action. Um, because it's something in my heart or our hearts that has taken the place of God. Let me give you a story from my life to illustrate it. As many of you know, um, I worked at a company called Squid, and several folks here worked at that same company. I was there for like three years. The founder were, were, were Christians, and I loved the job. It was a great job. Um, and then at the end of three years, I got pushed out. Um, and it was, it was tough. Um, I, I, from my perspective, I was treated very poorly, and it hurt. Um, I remember... I remember one Sunday, I was in the chapel back there, and this is like a week or two, I was actually crying back there, and my friend Tony and uh, Matt Lyman, who both work with me, came to me and they were praying, and if you don't know the chapels on the other side of the narthex, um, you all know what the narthex is, right? <laughs> Pagans. Uh, it's not a lobby, it's a narthex, okay? And... Uh, and I, I was angry for a while, and I, but that anger, and I don't know if you remember, if you were here when I was talking about forgiveness, it grew into bitterness. And, 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 and looking back on it, I'm like, well, why was I so upset? Yeah, maybe I was probably treated poorly, but compared to what? Compared to Jesus? Compared to lots of people that have been treated way more poorly? And what I realized was I had put too much value on that job. I was a C-level position. I was chief revenue officer. I had almost 50 people reporting to me. And my ego, my value was tied up in that. And so it was not that I was wronged. It was that I had put too much value in it that caused me to have the bitterness rise up and cause me to move into evil desires and sins. And so that's how it works is something happens to us, it impacts our emotional inner life, and we go the wrong way. Um, next slide. So, so why do we enslave ourselves to idols? If we know Jesus, right, we know the gospel, we know the good news, we know we're free, why do we keep doing things like that? Why did I do that? Well, number one, we are designed by God to worship. Um, I, I remember one of my first jobs, my, my boss telling me, and this is back 20 plus years ago, oh, I worship nature. Well, what a weird word to use, if not in the, not in the confines of a religious term, I worship. But we do, we all worship something. And what happens is, in our lives, things hit us, right? And negative things hit us. We call them moods, okay? Well, when that happens, we have something we can do with it. Okay? We have to address it because it causes, moods cause emotional pain. They cause turmoil. Well, we can either try to stuff it, which, you know, again, it's going to bubble up, or we can bring it to God, or we can do something else with it. And instinctively, the way we are wired, our sin nature, is we're going to want to stop that pain. 
And the way we do that is basically moving into a cycle, what I call the idol idolatry sin cycle, or maybe called the sin cycle. And it'll look very similar to what you've seen from uh, addiction. Now, this is a cycle that I borrowed from David Ackman, but like most things, I've significantly improved upon it. <laughs> and and you'll, you'll see that as we go through. Um, so this concept of moods that's described in the scriptures, uh, it, it comes from the Greek word pathos. And again, what it means is a negative passion or a churning in our inside. Think of any time somebody does something or something happens and you get upset about it. You're angry, you're sad, you're bitter. And you can see I've listed some of kind of these key types of negative moods. And we've all experienced them, right? One or the other, maybe all of them. Um, and what happens with these moods is they cause this pain. It, it causes pain. And as humans, we want to get out of pain. So instinctively what we do is we go to what we remember works. We go to a pain killer. And we call a lot of times, in this slide, it's called a lust for something. And that something has the possibility of becoming an idol. Now, when we hear the word lust in our culture, we think of sex. That's not what that word means. A lust is not a desire for something bad. It's an over-desire for something good. Um, and that's what happens. We, we, we have this desire, this inordinate desire for something good. And because of that, it creates an idol out of that thing. And what drives us there is this mood or passion. And we want to get out of the pain. And that's what drives us to that. So let me give, again, some quick examples. You're bored. This one happens to me all the time, right? I'm bored. What do I do? I pull up my cell phone and I read the news. Maybe you go to instant Instagram. Maybe you play games. But then if you look at your life and if we honestly observe ourselves or observe the culture, we all do it all the time. And so all of a sudden this phone becomes this thing that is, we have an inordinate desire for because it is a killer of boredom. Another example would be, I'm fearful for my financial security. So what do I do with that? Well, I throw myself at work. I throw myself at making money. Well, when I do that, I have this inordinate desire or lust for money. It becomes an idol in my life. Same thing with, here's an interesting one. Uh, maybe I'm a stay-at-home parent. And I see all these other people that are working, they're making money, etc. And I don't feel good about myself because I'm not out there doing that. I'm a stay-at-home parent. So what do I do? Perhaps I make an idol out of my family. Perhaps what I do is I say my value is going to come from my children. Now, I'm not saying that children aren't important. And remember, don't get in. None of these things I'm talking about are bad in and of their own right. They become idols when I put the focus on them over God. They become essential. They become the thing that I need to be happy and to be satisfied. That's when something becomes an idol. Okay? The problem with these idols is that they never fulfill. People always let you down. Money is never enough. Boredom, that's always going to come back. And so I'm just giving you some examples. And, and some of these things are, again, I, I don't mean to be simplistic about this. Some of this stuff is way more powerful. Sometimes we get into chemical issues as well. It could be alcohol addiction. It could be drug addiction. It could be depression. You know, and, and, and so we need help with those things. But this is how it works. And what happens is once we get through the high of the fix, i.e., I made more money, so I feel good about myself. And then all of a sudden, I need more money. I need a bigger house, right? And it starts that mood again. And so the cycle repeats itself. So the good news is that Jesus has given us access to break this cycle. And just to remind you how I improved upon Ekman, this is it. So we've got that, we've got that sin cycle, that idolatry sin cycle in the middle. And what this picture is showing us is that 
Prior to Christ coming, the world was enslaved under the law. Okay? Whether you're a believer or not, you had the law. Okay? And you were enslaved in it. Um, and what happened was when Christ died, the image of the cross, if you recall from the Gospels, the veil in the temple was rent, was ripped from top to bottom. So what the veil was, was this six inch thir- thick woven curtain that they said, you know, hor- uh, a group of horses couldn't pull apart. And it separated inside the Jewish temple, the, the temple court from what was called the Holy of Holies, where God's presence dwelled. And so what Jesus did when he died, that veil was torn. And now we have access to God immediately that we didn't before. Why is this important? What it allows us to do is go to God immediately with things when mood hits. So it also ushered in what Paul talks about in the Bible of the age to come, as opposed to what he calls in Galatians uh, chapter 1, this present evil age. That's the evil age that you're under. Now notice in the graph that those two go along in parallel. Okay? So Christ dies, we believe, and we become new creatures, new man, new men, new women. Okay? We are identified with Jesus. However, we still have the flesh. We still live here on earth. So we have this um, situation where uh, I'm trying to remember what Kimberly told me. Hold on. <laughs> what was it, Kimberly? It's not yet, but... What's that? Already, Already but not yet. Already, God has come. The, we're, we are new creations, but it's not fully over yet because we're in this in-between stage, which is why the red line and the green line continue. And we find ourselves between these two, these two kind of the old man and the new man. And so, the new man, we have freedom. We live by grace. We walk in the spirit. The old man, we choose slavery, just like the Galatians. They're choosing, rather than to live by freedom and to know that they're fully accepted, they're going back into slavery. And the slavery they're choosing is to follow the Jewish law. We maybe choose different modes of slavery. Um, And then we are driven by these evil desires or lusts, these inordinate desires for something good that take over and create idols out of those things. And then we call that walking by the flesh. So how do we break it? Jesus gives us access. How do we do it? And I'm, I'm, a, I'm an engineer by background, so I'm very linear, and I, I like to think sequentially and, and simply about things. So what I'm going to walk through, it's, it's simple. It's just not easy at all. And it's very difficult to do this on a day-by-day, hour-by-hour basis. I fail at it all the time. But I think the concepts are simple. And I think as we work on it and we try to do it, we can get better and better at it. So, three steps. And again, it all is keyed off of when a mood hits us. When we are hit by a negative emotion, there is an opportunity to deal with it by walking by the Spirit rather than by the flesh. So uh, a a bad mood is like an alert. It's a negative alert. It says, go to the Father. Uh, Ackman has this great story. He talks about, y'all familiar with Snow White and the Seven Dwarves? Well, there's an ulterior universe, kind of like Bizarro Superman. There's Bizarro Dwarf World. And these dwarves are called guilt and shame, and bitterness, and anxiety, those moods we talked about. And in Snow White's world, she, if you remember, slept, went, found the, the dwarf's house and slept in it, and then they found her, and the story goes on. In Bizarro Snow White world, the dwarves' jobs is that when they find you, or you find them, when you become anxious, when you become bitter, when you become uh, depressed, the job <clears throat> of those dwarfs is to take you to the father's house. Okay? They can't go into the father's house because they're not allowed there. And never 
ever pick up a dwarf. Ever. Think about it. If you pick up a dwarf, you may not know this, but they're afraid of heights, and they'll grab you by the neck and they'll strangle you. Okay? So I want you to think about that. When you get hit by a negative mood, okay? When you get hit by anxiety, when you get hit by bitterness, when you get hit by feelings of worthlessness, you never pick up and hold on to that feeling. The purpose of that feeling is to take you to God. And it's to take you to God immediately. We see here in Romans 6, chapters, uh, verses 12 through 14, um, <clears throat> he says, instead, we are to present ourselves to God. Now this word present, uh, the Greek word is paristeme. And it doesn't just mean show up. It means you're to be at the ready, you're to stand ready and immediately go near. So I want you to think about the, there's a, there's a, there's a sense of urgency here, okay? And I, this is where we screw up. What we do, or at least what I do, is I hold on to those moods, okay? And that's what leads us into that cycle. God's saying no. Paul's saying no. Do not hold on to that mood. That mood, the purpose of that is to remind you, this is not who I am. I need to go to the Father, Okay? Secondly, we are to share our troubles with God. Uh, there's a verse in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, and I, I think many of you are probably familiar with this. Um, it, 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 a lot of your translations might read, be anxious about nothing. Really, that word means be troubled about nothing. Uh, and I, and I, I like the word troubled better because I think in our culture, anxiety has a much narrower connotation than, than what we think about. Troubles are all these things we're talking about. Um, be troubled about nothing. And then he gives us some very specific ideas of what to do. You're to pray. You are to make supplication. That's a really churchy word. All that means is you're to ask for something earnestly, something I really want, okay? Uh, you're to give thanksgiving. Anytime we're feeling bad about ourselves, anytime... What, is, what does Paul say? Rejoice, rejoice always. We are, to, we are to give thanksgiving for what we know the good things that we have, even in times of emotional turmoil. And then we are to make our specific requests known to God. Okay? One thing Paul doesn't say here is how long you're supposed to do this. Sometimes prayer can be very quick. Sometimes it could take days. It could take a long time to work through these issues. If you've got a chemical dependency, if you struggle with depression, right, or anxiety, sometimes this stuff isn't immediate. Prayer is never time-based. It's issue-based. So remember that. But this is how God tells us to deal with it. And then finally, step three tells us we are to walk step by step with the Spirit. In Galatians 5, Paul is contrasting, remember the two worlds, the age to come and the present evil age? He's contrasting walking by the Spirit of God versus walking in the flesh. And in verse 17, the term that's used, the first verse that's uh, at top there, uh, when he says walk by the Spirit, is, is, is describing the overall work of the Spirit as we walk. It's that influence of the Spirit. However, down in verse 25, it's a different Greek word for walk. Your translation probably says walk, but it's actually a different Greek word. And what's interesting about this is that the second word in verse 25 that I've got there in yellow as step by step, it's, it's a word which means let's keep in step like soldiers in formation. And it's not like they're taking big steps. They're like this. Okay? And so the, the, the comment is is that if you want to live in the Spirit, you need to be walking in lockstep with the Spirit of God. Short steps, you need to be tightly aligned. So as we think about that, we're, we're talking about our emotional life because emotions drive so much, right? A lot of times you go to church, we don't talk about emotions. We talk about intellectually understanding things, but that doesn't really help me. I need to tie it to our emotions. You need to tie it to our emotions because we're all emotional beings. God is emotional. That's how we were designed. That's how we were built. So what he's saying is, if we are walking step by step with the Spirit, 
when that mood hits us, we're going to be ready for it. Going back to Romans 6, we will be standing by ready. So when that mood hits, we go to the Father. We don't stew in it. So again, we walk closely with the Spirit, and the result of the Spirit is the, what are called the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, etc. When we don't, when we don't walk with the Spirit and we allow those moods to grab hold of us, to strangle us, what happens? That's when we start to walk out in the old way, as the old person. We start to walk and act in the flesh. Anger, outs of anger, bitterness, um, idolatry, impurity. So that's what he's calling us to do. So in conclusion, we're designed to worship, and it's up to us to choose what we're going to worship. As John said in 1 John, that last little verse after five chapters of how to live and how to love and how to relate to people and relate to God, little children, keep yourselves from idols. It's our role to keep ourselves from idols. And those idols aren't those stupid little dumb wooden things that maybe we look back at and say how foolish they were. Oh no, we're much more sophisticated. Our idols are the things that we desire, that we want, that we don't call idols. Don't fool yourselves. When trouble hits, that's going to be our instinct. As sinful people, that will be our instinct. We'll be to run to those painkillers, those idols that give us that temporary high. But what Paul is saying is, no, you need to be on guard. You need to be walking step by step with the Spirit. So when those bad things happen, when those moods hit, when you are churned up, that pathos, we immediately go to God, Romans 6. Philippians 4, we share with God. We bring it to him in prayer, and we take as long as it takes. And as I said, sometimes these things can be, you know, much more significant you bring support into it. You go to counseling. Sometimes you have to have medication for severe stuff. But you bring it to God in prayer. And you ask for his help. You share our troubles with him. And then finally, in order to keep living the way he wants, we walk step by step aligned with the Spirit. Uh, if you close with me. Father, thank you for this time. Um... Help me to not just teach about this, but to do it in my life on a regular basis. I pray this is helpful to people. Um, I know this is how you want us to live. Um, the concepts are easy. The execution is difficult. Help us to be in community with one another, to help each other in this. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the freedom that you give us to live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. In Jesus' name, amen.